I have a confession to make. I like poetry. It's probably because I was an English lit major. In fact, I probably wouldn't be even admitting to liking poetry had it not been for the fact that I had studied English literature. And so when we were um, traveling out in the New England states uh, in August, uh, one of the things that I had forgot about from my college experience some 30 years ago is that a lot of my favorite authors lived in that neck of the woods. And so one of the things that uh, we ended up doing when one of Laura's college friends um, said, hey, did you know Emily Dickinson lives nearby about 10, 15 miles north? I'm like, no, so let's go see her house, which is kind of important because she was pretty much a recluse. And so we drove, adjusted our plans, drove a couple hours to drive 15 or 10, 15 miles because there was all kinds of road construction and we got stuck in the middle of. But uh, we finally get to see the house and where she lived and it was really, really cool. And she is one of my favorite American, in fact, probably the favorite American poet that I had. And uh, one of her, the lines that I've always remembered comes from one of her poems and she said, tell the truth, but tell it slant. Now, before I got into college, I was much more of a logic, math kind of guy, scientist kind of a person. And one of the reasons why I didn't like poetry is poetry is not very precise, right? It's very picturesque. But for those of us who like, you know, precision, when you say something like, tell the truth, but tell it slant, the question is, what does she mean? I mean, is she meaning kind of like distort or bend the truth like a lot of politicians do? You know, they kind of tell the truth enough, but they slant it a little bit. Is it that what she means? Or is she talking more along the lines of softening the truth? So something like, I'm becoming follically challenged instead of saying I'm growing bald, right? I mean, is that what she means, to be softened? Or is it more along the lines of restating or rephrasing something so that a person has a a more likely chance of receiving the truth? We're not quite sure. You know, you can kind of guess, but that's the nature of poetry. It's kind of beautiful. It's memorable. But it isn't always precise. And as a result, we can struggle with what does it mean? That is the challenge before me today as we open up our the scriptures to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we're going to be in verses uh, 5, 1 through 7. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, and we're looking at a very poetical portion of scripture, and there are a lot of ways in which this could be understood and interpreted. In fact, uh, I don't know if you noticed the uh, title of today's sermon, but the dangers of loving God does not sound like something a pastor should be preaching, right? But I'm trying to convey, best I can grasp, something that is important for us to be warned about from God, because what matters is what does God mean as he inspired, who I think probably was likely Solomon, to write these words of poetry that almost sound like, should they be even included in the scriptures? As I spend a lot of time and effort working, I would definitely say, I think they need to be included in the scriptures. And and hopefully by the end of the service, uh, and by the end of the, the sermon, the Holy Spirit will have worked and used his scripture in these in your life in a powerful way but we're looking at ecclesiastes chapter 5 verses 1 through 7 ecclesiastes 5 1 through 7 and there are two basic truths they're kind of contrasting truths that come out of this passage some ways they're very much linked but to put them together would make a very cumbersome sentence so i split them up and the first truth is this that when relating to god Fools absurdly sin with biblical actions by impulsively seeking to impress him. When it comes to relating to God, there are people who the scriptures call fools. And the reason why they're called fools is because they absurdly sin in doing biblical actions. Things the Bible actually tells us to do. But they do those actions impulsively seeking to impress God. God is warning us 
that when you want to relate to me, you need to understand there is a danger in trying to have a relationship with me, and that is you're doing it for yourself, basically. That's what we see in the seven verses. Now, there are three different biblical actions that I think are presented in these verses. The first is presents or gifts to God that we want to give. The second is prayers that we lift up to God. And then the third are promises we make to God. All are biblical actions. All have been instructed in the scriptures on what to do and how to do it. There are those three categories, and he takes one verse to address presence. He takes two verses to address prayers, and then he takes four verses to address promises. So it kind of expands as, he, as we go through on. So we're going to start off with uh, the verse 1. Guard your steps when you, go n- near to that, when you go to the house of God. To draw near, to listen, is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know what they are doing, that they, what they are doing is evil. So, here's one of the biggest issues in this passage, and that relates to tone. Unfortunately, they didn't have voice recorders in the ancient day, and so we could have heard Solomon's tone. We have to kind of discern it. Depending upon the tone that is being expressed here is going to shape or affect your understanding of what God is trying to teach. One set of commentators who are committed deeply to the Scriptures think that basically Solomon or whoever is speaking here is being very sarcastic and cynical. That there was a time in their life where there was just like, hey, if you're going to go to church, you better be careful. Kind of an idea. That is one set. The other set where I would put myself, based on my study of this passage, is that Solomon is actually being somber. He might be drawing upon time of his life when he had been more cynical in saying this, or saying this passage, but he's actually saying, you know what, I've come to understand that was wrong. This is now something we need to be taking seriously, because unfortunately, in people claiming to worship or relate to God, we can be, it is actually possible to be a fool. A fool is someone, biblically, who ultimately rejects God, even though it looks like they are loving Him. So that's one of the the big issues. The other issue that I wrestled with in this whole passage is what is he actually talking about in terms of our relationship with it? How does it apply or connect to today, right? He says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. The house of the God, house of God in his day, was the temple that he made. And so it is a place where people would gather. And so as you think about temple and the going to the house of God in the New Testament, it very clearly says that we as the church are the place of God's temple, not the physical building like they had in the Old Testament. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within each believer, when whenever we assemble, there's a greater presence of God here. So is he talking about corporate worship? When you come to the church and worship with God's people, be careful that you don't be a fool who offers the kinds of sacrifices that fools offer. Or is he talking about something else? I think he can include coming to church, but I think the larger concept here is one's personal, individual relationship with God. Yes, when you went to the temple, you were surrounded by all the other Jewish people who were wanting to be coming to the temple and worshiping God. But what I found interesting as I went throughout this passage is no one else is really ever mentioned And so I struggled when I was coming up with a sermon outline when I said, should I say, when worshiping God or when relating to God? And I think the idea here is the broader, the bigger, our relationship with God, which yes, definitely connects with coming to church and worship, but it extends out into the rest of our lives. And I think that that will become obvious as we kind of work through this passage. So those are some of the key issues that I had to first address. It says, guard your steps when you go near to the temple, when you gather the worship, when you're trying to relate to God. Because in that day, the primary place where you connected with God was 
the temple or the tabernacle. In fact, here, the, the idea that it's a personal relationship really gets hammered, I think, even more home to draw near, to come close to God. There's this desire at some levels that a person, I want to get close to God. He said, it's better for you to listen than to offer the sacrifice of fools. What's he talking about when he says the sacrifice of fools? Well, in Hebrew, there are a number of different words that are translated as sacrifice in English. And this is a specific one. He is not talking here, based on the Hebrew, about the sacrifices for sin or guilt offerings, right? Those are what allowed a person to enter and have access to God. In the New Testament, we understand that those Old Testament sacrifices prefigured the cross, right? Christ died for our sins. His blood covers our guilt. So he's not talking about entrance into the kingdom. He uses a different word for sacrifices. He uses the word for sacrifice that relates to like special offerings and, and, and opportunities where you're, you're, you're already inside, you've already entered, but now you're saying, I enjoy my relationship with God. So at some levels, a fool who ultimately rejects God is still offering sacrifices that basically lets everyone know that, hey, I, I really love God. I, I like Him. And yet that fool does not even realize that what they are doing is what? They are doing evil. We have the capacity to so deceive ourselves, we actually think we're drawing near to God when in fact we are not. God is actually repulsed by such sacrifices. That sacrifice of enjoyment of God can be kind of put together this way. It's like smashing together a couple different things. It's the, the part of the sacrifice was going and getting your, your best animals that cost a lot of money. And so it's, it's like our offering boxes in the back. There is the sense in which I'm giving money towards God to show how much I love Him by giving Him gifts. There's also a potluck piece. One of the differences between sin and guilt offerings and these enjoyment offerings of these celebration offerings is where there was like you actually ate the meal with the priest who was helping you sacrifice. And so there's this, this potluck, there's this, I'm having a meal with God. A barbecue, literally, is almost the, be the best illustration. And then there's this component of worship and praise. God, I praise you for how you've worked in my life. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about the sacrifice of fools. They, they claim that they are, you know, they, they've actually spent some money. You know, they think they're having a, a lunch with God and they're, they're thanking him. But really, what they are doing is evil. What they're doing is evil. Because really, all they're doing is going through the motions. Yes, they've spent the money. Yes, they're eating. But they're just going through the motions. And unfortunately, that happens today. I once we attended a, a church when I was in seminary in Dallas, and I was talking to the pastor there that I worked under years later. And he said, do you remember such and such an individual? I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, he was in the kind of the financial realm and he at one point decided to give a very, very large gift to the church to help them pay off the building debt. Unfortunately, that sacrifice, which seemingly was wonderful and great and was actually a form of evil and expression because the SEC came to the church and said, hey, by the way, the money that he used to give that large gift came out of fraud in his life. People who come to church can even give large gifts, and yet they are so deceived, they think they're loving God, but actually they're just going through the motions because they just want God to be impressed so that He blesses their life. That's not the kind of thing God is looking for when it comes to presence. 
second, as we see in verses 2 and 3, relates to prayers. There's a good way and there's a bad way to pray, and we're going to look at the bad way first. Be not rash. Don't be hurried and rushed with your mouth. Nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Don't pray too much is what it sounds like. Don't pray too long. Now, I know sometimes people in the past have said, Pastor, sometimes your prayers seem long. Well, they are. I've said, well, I've actually been in churches where they've been even longer, two to three times longer. I once had a pastor who really ministered a lot to me. The prayers were 20 minutes long for the church and the community. And yet they were cherished by God's people. Now, that's not really what they're talking about here. What I think Solomon's talking about, he's talking about one thing. If I were to stand and pray about one issue for 20 minutes, then we might say, hey, this is what's going on. That's exactly what Solomon is warning people out. We saw it in the New Testament. Basically, the word for fool in worship in the New Testament is hypocrite. They're trying to impress God with his words. Their words. Why? Why? Because they want something from Him. If someone impresses you, and then they turn around and ask something from you, you're more like, you know, this is a good person. Do not be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Don't, just, don't go, don't try to impress God with how you pray. For dream comes with much business, and a fool's voice with many words. This apparently is a kind of an idiom in his day. The, the challenge is we're not quite sure how to actually interpret the meaning of this phrase. I've got four different ver- variants of how you can understand this. Right? Here's the first one. Normal dreams cause, a work, cause work to decipher. You ever have dreams? You know, we sometimes share our dreams. I wonder what that means. You know what I mean? That kind of a thing. In the ancient world, especially try to figure out your dream because maybe that gives you guidance as far as how you should live your life. The second, prophetic dreams cause work to respond. Here's the idea of uh, cause the work to respond. Here, Joseph, Old Testament Joseph, you know, he has the dreams of the sheaves and the, the stars and they're all bowing down. And so you understand because here God is actually speaking and so you want to align yourself with what God is doing. And so that requires work. So is that what's being talked about here? The third one is more aspirations like, oh, my, my greatest dream is to, to go visit Australia, right? Or something along those lines. The, the aspiration, well, in order to bring about that desire into my life, it's going to require a lot of work to bring it about. That's one. And then the last flips them all in the end. And hard work causes a lot of dreams at night. You work really hard, and all of a sudden, you, your mind is just kind of going, and you, so you never even relax at night. All four of those are possible. I think what he's talking about here, though, is number three, primarily because of its connection, as we'll see if you verses later in verse 7, where what he's talking about is in your praying, you have something you want in life. There's something that's going on you want to see some growth in or you want to see some advancement in. And so you're spending all this effort trying to convince God to do what you want to do. That, my friends, is being rash with your mouth. Well, through my prayers, I'm going to force God's hand to get what I want. That is foolish. That is something that you're trying to basically use prayer as a form of manipulating God to get what you want. Now, thankfully God has been working in my life because I might have been more like that as an adult as I was as a kid. And what I mean by that is There was a time as a kid, did I not? Oh, there it is. Time as a kid where I really wanted this, something like this, a 
archery set with where the, the arrows had suction cups on the end. You know what I'm talking about? That's what's being shown here. They have those suction cups. I really wanted that for Christmas. And unlike what I normally did, where I just hair is what I asked, I kept on trying to talk to my parents about it, right? To try to manipulate and force their hand to getting them what I want. That's what he's talking about here. Someone who uses prayer to kind of force God to do what that person wants them to do. That, my friends, is a fool. And that, my friends, is what is commanded that we should not do. And as a result, we sin when we use so many words. The last one gets to promises. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. In the ancient world, it was rather common. We don't do it as much today, but you still hear a little bit about it. God, if you do this, I'll do that. Right? Anyone prayed that prayer, kind of a prayer before? Not, not too many, you know what I mean? It's actually somewhat biblical, right? It is something you can do. In fact, the psalmist does it a fair amount. God, if you do this, I will sing forth your praises. If you rescue me from the evil one. It's not that bad to do, but it is. Beware when you do give a vow to God. And by the way, the word vow here is only in the Scriptures ever used in reference to a person's relationship with God. It's never to government or swearing and stuff like that. It's only in your commit when you do commit something and God keeps His word, do not delay in paying it. Often there would be like a special sacrifice. That's where you come along with it. Verse 1, you offer these sacrifices. For He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. See, it's coming out of a person's relationship, and all of a sudden, you know, we kind of get excited. We've got this idea, you know, we're going to get this. God gives it to us, and then, you know what? We kind of forget about it. We don't keep our word. He's delivered. He's answered the prayer as we wanted. We could, but we don't. Do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Now, here's another one of those. What is the messenger here? There's like three or four different options. It could be an official related to the temple worship who when people said, hey, this is what I'm promising, when they hear that it's been delivered, that person would go follow up. That happened in a lot of other cultures. And so what he's warning us to do is that when that messenger shows up and says, hey, where is that promise that you're going to give to God based on his answer to prayer, you say, oh, no, that was a mistake. That was an accidental. I, I, I didn't really mean that. No, that's sin. Messenger could also be uh, the priest in the temple when you're interacting with him. It could also even be an angel. The word messenger is also could be translated and is translated as angel. And in this particular case, it's along the lines of what Paul says, that as you make vows or in your conduct of worship, you, you defile the angels who are observing. Whatever the case is, what is clear is that that person or that being brings about some kind of conviction that, you know what, you made a promise and God now asks you to fulfill your side of the promise. And you don't. Why then should God be angry at your voice? Just hearing your prayers gets upset and so destroys and punishes the work of your hands. Here you, you try to get ahead. God actually helps you get ahead and then you don't keep your word. And as a result, you're condemned. For when dreams increase, the words grow many. There is vanity or absurdity. Here's where I think the, the word dreams kind of indicates its aspirations. Where you want all of this in life, you start to just... Jump out and just say, oh, God, give me this. God, give me that. And if you do that, I'll get, you know what I mean? All this kind of stuff. It's kind of this barter transaction kind of work. And you're really not interested in serving God. That's 
one of the ways in which you absurdly self-destruct. You know, another thing that's interesting? If I'm not mistaken, the first God-caused death in the church was what and who? Ananias and Sapphira. And what was it over? Likely a vow that they had made. They sold some of their property, but they didn't give as much as they had promised. And as a result, they were lying to the Holy Spirit. It still applies today. If you make a promise to God, make sure you keep it. Which then leads us actually to the second point. You can be a fool in worship. You can be a fool in your relationship with God. Or you can be truly a person who is seeking to know who God is. When relating to God, first listen, then live with biblical actions by humbly seeking to fear Him. See, the difference between the fool and the true saint is that the fool is just trying to make impress God to make their life better. The saint instead says, God, I don't deserve you. I am humble before you. I respect you highly. I want to honor you. It's all about you and not about my life. If you notice, I skipped a couple of verses or didn't emphasize certain things, so let's go back through and catch the positive side. Guard your steps. Literally, the word has the idea of restraining. Don't become a fool. Don't go through the motions. Don't give, put anything in the offering basket just because you feel you have to. Watch yourself. When you draw near, when you come close to God, your focus is to listen first and to learn. Listen, understand where He's coming from. Understand the truth that God has. That is better than the sacrifice of fools. You see, in this passage, by implication, there are three types of things that Solomon warns us about in our relationship with God. We can have the appearance, the hypocrisy, that we love God, and so we are a fool in worship. That's bad. What's better than that are some of these other things. Just come and listen. Just come and learn. Just come and observe. Don't worry about putting anything in the offering plate. Only put things in the offering box if God has been leading you. For the best are people who do what God wants them to do, but for the reasons that God wants them to do it. It's not just a matter of what you do, but it's also why and how you go about doing it. Draw near, listen, pay attention before you start to say, hey, God, I want to give you my life. That is better when it comes to presence. When it comes to prayers, don't be rash, don't be hasty. You know, again, we're talking about people that were coming to the temple. It wasn't like it was in a crisis, and so they just were kind of obsessed by the crisis, right? They knew what was going on. Be direct. All you have to say, God, I just need you. I trust you no matter what you choose to do. Let your words be few. State your need and trust in the character and person of God so that you know He will answer, and whatever His answer is, is what you need more than what you thought you need. Or when it comes to the promises we make, when you vow a vow, don't put it off in paying it. Fulfill it. Hannah is a good example of this one, right? Hannah in the Old Testament childless god if you give me a child i will give you that person back to serve you samuel is born and what does she do once she's once he's weaned she didn't delay in paying it and as a result all of our lives were transformed through that vow that was genuinely made but notice what solomon says when you vow a vow do not delay paying it for he has no pleasure in fools Pay what you vow. 
But here's, here's verse 5. It's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. God says, I would rather you be stingy with me than steal from me. Remember, it's bad, better, best. I mean, best is where, you know, that you actually give and when you make that vow. But Solomon warns us, you will unnecessarily make it harder for yourself if you try to use God as a gumball machine to make your life better. In fact, one of the reasons why I don't think Solomon is being sarcastic here and snide is he basically is quoting Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23. God says, you know what? If you're not ready to give up what you claim that you want to give up, don't. It's not a sin not to vow. But there are times as a person's spiritual life occurs and grows and matures where when God does something or when you really want to see Him work in a special way, you say, this is what I'm going to do if you do this, God. But make sure you pay it. Or others, you will pay for it. Instead, God is the one you must fear. You see, the difference between the fool and the saint, and I use saint here by anyone who is genuinely seeking after God. I'm not talking about someone who is super mature, although that would person would be included. But the difference between a fool and a saint is the fool views God as someone to serve him. The saint views God as someone to serve. God, when you've done amazing things in my life, I just rejoice so much. I want to just pour out the presence, pour out the sacrifices, sing forth the praises. In times of my life when I see need, I'm going to shortly tell you what I need, but I trust that whatever you do, I am going to trust your good is good enough for me. When I make a promise to you, and you keep your word, I am committed to keeping my word as well. Because I fear you. I am doing this not to impress you, but to serve you. So how do we take this home in our everyday lives or when we come to church? Don't swagger, be humble. Don't swagger. Don't be proud. Don't be arrogant. Be humble. Now, some of you were snickering as I did that. I think you caught my illusion, right? What am I alluding to here? This song, you remember this song? I'm not going to play it. Don't worry, be happy. Don't swagger, be humble. Kind of an idea. Why did I want to play off of that? The words of this, this song says life is going to be a problem. There's going to be a lot of difficulties in life. But when you worry, you double your trouble. Trouble happens, but if you worry about it, you double your trouble. Here in our worship, in our relationship with God, whether it's at church or out and about the community. Right? Don't injure the honor that you want to give to God. You can undermine it by being a hypocrite. Three ways. Whoops. Am I going backwards? What happened there? Oh, that's a song. Well, well, don't you know? I put the wrong picture in. Oh, that's so funny. I had the Ecclesiastes picture. All right, we're going to just go back to that. Don't swagger. Be humble. What I want us to do is I want us to do a worship checkup. And by worship, I don't mean just here, but here and where we live and conduct our lives. Presence. Gifts that you give to God. Why'd you show up today? Just going through the motions? Habit? Wanting to oppress God or someone else? Or did you show up because I need God in my life? I 
This is why I think Solomon was being very, very somber and serious in what he's saying. Why do we spend so much time reading Scripture and preaching? Why is that longer than singing and fellowship? It's because, first of all, listen. Learn before you respond. One of the greatest ways in which it was true in my heart, and I have heard it a number of times as pastor, as the recipient, is where in my pride and in my arrogance, where I thought, you know what, it's all about me, I show up and did I get anything out of that sermon or service? Did I like the style of worship? And at one point, God convicted me, why are you coming, Troy? Why are you coming? And that, I was just like, God, forgive me. I have since gotten something that God wanted to speak to me out of some of the worst public speakers ever. Because as Moses know, and as Paul knows, it's not the eloquence that changes us. It's the Word of God. And the Spirit of God convicting. And whoever he puts up here, short of preaching heresy, right? Short of preaching anything less than what the Word of God, if they speak God's truth, there is something there for us. Or otherwise, we're fools and wasting our time coming here on Sundays. Why are we showing up? Have we come to listen and learn, or are we trying to impress God about what we've got or what we've given? Did my batteries just die? Oh, okay, no, okay. Prayers. Are we praying because we're trying to convince God to give us a yes? Or are we praying and just saying, God, this is what I need, but I trust you. This is what I think I want, but whatever your good you choose to give me, I will accept. I've heard a number of misstatements, I hope. At worst, it reveals the heart and the thinking that really is not biblical. The reason why we pray is not to try to twist God's arm, but to commune with Him in the circumstances that we are going through. But I've heard a number of believers say, God said yes because I had so many people praying for me. Friends, that's not true. God only needs one word, one prayer. Now, notice it says, let your words be few, not your prayers be few, right? In fact, Jesus says, keep bringing those prayers like the widow that was, un, you know, was being mistreated. You see, it's not our eloquence. It's our humility in saying, God, I will receive from you whatever you choose to give. But it's more important to share with you my life and what's going on than getting what I think I want. I mean, how many here have ever prayed for something, and then you got it, and then you wondered why in the world you prayed for it to begin with? <laughs> right? That's what I'm talking about. But all the time. God is in heaven. He has the best perspective. He's got a perfect perspective. He has full power. He knows what's best. And sometimes, like children, you don't get what you pray for. But you always get God's goodness. Why are we praying? Are we just trying to manipulate God? To make a better life for ourselves? 
Are we truly depending upon Him and trusting Him that no matter how He works, He is worthy of it, of all our worship? Promises. Whenever we do special offerings, as long as I am pastor here, you will always hear me say, pray first. Seek God in it. So we did with the audiovisual lighting thing, which is still going through the rest of this year to pay for as much of it through our offerings. When Dennis's medical equipment came up, pray first. I care more about that you're listening to what God wants you to do and give than any pressure from us. I don't want people putting anything in the offering box because it's an obligation. Or they're trying to look good to one another. No. God will take care of our needs if we are pursuing His purposes. But don't be a fool in giving up money that you really don't ever intend to give. Or saying that you will. You see, it boils down to why are we here? Are we humble, needing God to work, and we want to honor Him fully in however He has worked and however He has blessed us? Or are we here to impress Him, impress others, just to make our lives just a little bit better? One is foolish. The other is the work of God in a person's life. I'd like us to close this sermon service. You got a first place? Congratulations. I forgot to write that down. I'm sorry to yeah. That's all right. Good job. Sorry I forgot that. What I'd like us to do is close in a moment of silent prayer. I'm just going to read the three words. Present, presence, prayers, promises. Talk to your Lord. See what the Spirit says in your heart as we do a worship checkup on our lives. And then I'll close us in prayer. Let us pray. Presence. Gifts. Our prayers. Our promises. Father, it's good. To gather with your people and allow you to probe the motivations of our hearts and our lives. I pray that you would help us to be the kind of people that are committed to first listening 
and understanding all that you ask and want. And then live out that with the humility and reverence and fear that you expect of us. Forgive us for being fools and hypocrites. Lord, there 